My name's Tom Pennington Hare. I'm a senior associate here at Fox Williams in the employment team. Um, I work on a range of employment issues advising both companies and senior executives. Um, I'm going to be talking about restrictive covenants today because it's been, uh, there's been a lot of recent developments in terms of restrictive covenants, uh, in particular one case, the Tillman and Egon Zender case, which has radically changed the court's approach to restrictive covenants. So now's a good time to take stock of those developments and talk about what employers should be doing uh, to make sure that they're adequately protected. Employers typically use restrictive covenants in order to um, protect their legitimate business interests. That's things like their confidential information, uh, their trade connections with customers or suppliers, and also to protect a stable workforce, their key talent. Um, now, whilst employees are employed during the currency of their employment, they'll be subject to a number of expressed but also implied terms in their contracts of employment that prevent them from acting contrary to the interests of their employer. So prevent them from doing things like setting up a rival business on the side and using their employer's confidential information or prevent them from poaching clients. But when the employment relationship ends, those implied duties also come to an end. And so employers need a way to try and protect their business interests past the term of the employment. And that's where restrictive covenants come in. Um, they allow employers to um, restrict what their employees can do for a period of time after the employment, but only if they're very carefully drafted. The Egon Zender case is probably the most significant development in terms of restrictive covenant case law in the last 12 months or so. And there's really two key things that come out of the Egon Zender case. Um, firstly, that any restrictive covenant which is capable of operating uh, to prevent an employee holding um, any shares whatsoever in a competitor won't be enforceable. Um, and that's a real problem because many restrictive covenants, in particular non-competes, will purport to prevent an employee being interested in a competing business. Um, and that includes just a minority shareholding. It includes holding just one share in a competitor. And that renders the covenant too broad to be enforceable. And so the covenant falls away. Um, the other thing arising out of the Egon Zender case is the court's approach to severance. Um, the courts held that it's not possible to sever or delete um, the offending part of the covenant um, that renders it too wide and therefore unenforceable. Um, it's not possible to delete that part in order to leave the rest of the clause standing. And so if just one part of the restriction is too broad, then the whole thing will fall away and that can leave employers without adequate protection. In terms of practical tips, I think the first one has to be um, for employers to go back and look at their template employment contracts and see if their covenants um, suffer from this, um, this issue. Um, and it's likely that they will because this was quite a surprising decision by the Court of Appeal. Um, and I should mention that it's currently on appeal to the Supreme Court and so the approach may change. But for now, we're stuck with the decision that it is and so companies should be reacting to it now. So first thing is to go back and look at the restrictions and see where they ought to be amended. Um, if they do prevent a, uh, even a minority shareholding in a competitor, then they ought to be amended. Um, also, because of the court's decision on severance or striking out those offending parts of the, the restrictions that are too broad, the restrictions should be redrafted so that they're all fully standalone clauses. And that helps to address the risk of one part of the uh, restriction being too broad, impacting on all the other parts and causing them to fall away as well. Mm -hmm.